12 of the afternoon is the time. Um, I want to welcome everybody here in the room. As well as all the who are with us via Zoom uh, to this um, second TikTok um, from the TikTok series that we started in the fall semester. Uh, for this TikTok, we're very happy to have uh, Mr. Rudy Sarkar uh, with us today to, uh, uh, to tell us more about collective vehicles and about the risk uh, of sustainable mobility. Uh, Mr. Sarker serves as the president and uh, CEO of the American Center for Mobility. He has more than 20 years of experience in transportation innovation uh, in corporate, government, and entrepreneurial roles. Uh, formerly, he was uh, the deputy assistant to secretary of transportation for the U.S. Department of Energy. Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, EERE, where he established the focus on mobility systems. He has held leadership roles in multiple profit companies, including uh, Forge Nano and uh, Proterra. I hope I didn't uh, slaughter the names uh, when I said them. He was also the lead engineer on the third generation electric drive for the Chevy Ball. Uh, he holds uh, both bachelor's and master's of science degrees in chemical engineering, as well as an MBA with high distinction from the University of Michigan. Please welcome Mr. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and the opportunity to come talk to you today. And um, also, I wasn't sure if there was going to be people in the audience or this was a pure live, uh, live stream. So glad that there's uh, some folks here uh, in person. Uh, but also hopefully people can hear me clearly uh, on the Zoom call as well. Uh, I'm very excited here uh, to be sharing with you what we do at the, the uh, American Center for Mobility. And I want to kind of weave in um, my expertise and our background, what we do at ACM, into this topic of connected automated vehicles. And then I'll share with you a little bit of insights into, in terms of where we see the markets headed uh, on these technologies. Uh, the title of the talk is Shared Infrastructure for Accelerating the Validation of Connected and Automated Vehicles, and I'll kind of elaborate what we mean by shared infrastructure uh, and why that's important for testing of connected and automated vehicles as I go forward. Okay, so I, I thought I'd start off just with a little, uh, a, a few high-level stats. I'm not sure if people in the audience you know, keep up on where connected or autonomous vehicles are. A lot of people often uh, see the news and think it's here tomorrow, and some people think it's you know, 10 or 20 years away. So these are some public uh, uh, stats that we get from California, who keeps track of all of the automated uh, vehicles that are driving on the road in terms of how many miles they, they drive before they disengage and uh, you know, an operator has to take over, uh, as well as how many miles overall they drive. So back in, in 2020 in California, um, you can see that uh, some of the market leaders, Waymo and Cruise, were driving you know, as many as almost 30,000 miles uh, in automated vehicle uh, operation between times where a driver or a, uh, or a teleoperator had to take over the car, which basically means it drove on its own. There may have been a safety driver in the seat. Um, just a couple of years earlier, that was under 10,000 for most companies, and in some cases, it was under 1,000. So the amount of time that a car can drive um, on the road uh, without intervention has gone up considerably, but if you also think about it in the context of a robo taxi, that's still not a lot of miles, right? A taxi may drive much more than that in one given year. Similarly, uh, ABs are now driving millions of miles a year. So just in California alone, uh, in 2020, they were driving almost 2 million miles a year. Uh, 2019 was higher because of pre COVID. 2021, the stats haven't come out. So, you know, it, that seems like quite a bit. Uh, the market leaders, the Waymo, uh, have clocked more than 20 million miles uh, in, in, uh, in automated vehicle driving. And then at the, at the last publication, I saw 74,000 where there wasn't anybody even in as a safety driver. So again, the mileage is getting uh, up there, uh, makes you start to think that uh, things are, are progressing um, um, towards uh, a validated technology. Um, however, if you look at you know, what it takes to really validate a technology like this, uh, it takes a lot of mileage to, to really prove out all the different scenarios in which people have accidents. Uh, NHTSA, uh, you know, NHTSA has published their stats, which show 
Um, there's only about 1.1 fatalities for every 100 million miles driven. So if you put that in context, Waymo has driven 20 million miles, but on average, you have to drive 100 million miles before you run into any sort of fatality. Um, a very interesting study was published by Rand Corporation that's often referenced to give you perspective about how much do you have to drive before you can prove that an automated vehicle is safer than a, a human operated vehicle. Uh, in order to prove that an automated vehicle is 20% better than a human driver using 100 vehicles driving 25 miles an hour, uh, you have to drive 5 billion miles, right, on average to prove that that statistic holds. If you want to show that an AV is better at avoiding injuries, you have to drive 170 million miles. If you want to show that it's better at driving, uh, avoiding crashes, you still have to drive 28 million miles. Now, but you know there are there are ways to reduce that number in driving in terms of driving in very specific environments. Um, but the key message here is it takes a lot of miles uh, on the road before you encounter all the kinds of scenarios that people have accidents, things that we call edge cases. So uh, it's a big hurdle uh, for people to to uh, be properly validated. Uh, when I first joined ACM, and we are a closed test track, when I first joined, I was told that, well, uh, all of this will be done in public road driving. And I think, as we just noted, you have to drive a lot of miles uh, to validate EVs on roads. There's a significant shift towards doing as much as you can in simulation and in the cloud, doing billions of miles in the cloud. Uh, but again, you also need to then come back and do repeatable testing in a controlled way. And so the validation of connected and autonomous vehicles requires um, this virtuous cycle of public road testing to get data, simulation to accelerate the, your iterations on your scenarios, and then control track testing to, um, to validate technologies. The American Center for Mobility is a smart mobility test center, which is to say that we are not a traditional proving ground, which many auto companies have, that are designed to test the ride handling and vehicle dynamics or the, the mechanics of, the, of, of a vehicle. We are a next generation test facility, and our focus is on testing the intelligence of the vehicle with its sensing capabilities, its situational awareness, and its ability to make decisions under various challenging uh, driving scenarios. So, different than a traditional test track, purposely designed for the testing of connected and autonomous vehicles. Um, when ACM was initially formed, the focus was on um, cabs, uh, but we're seeing a lot more work also being done on what we call advanced driver assistance systems, where there's some degree of automation, but the driver is still in control of the car. And then we are doing a lot of work on electrification, extreme fast charging, vehicle to grid, cybersecurity type work. But ACM is in essence, a very large 500 acre track uh, that is specially designed for the testing of advanced vehicles. Uh, uh, it was built on a 500 acre property that was once a General Motors facility. It was repurposed to be a, a 500 acre proving ground. Uh, what constitutes a smart mobility test center are, are a few different layers. Uh, the first layer is the real road systems. And so not necessarily perfectly paved tracks that like you would see at a racetrack, but actual real roads that have, you know, faded lane lines, potholes, cracked lines, uh, because you want the sensors to be able to be operating in real world environments. And then on top of that is a network infrastructure and then specialized equipment. So ACM has a number of kind of purpose design test environments ranging from a high speed loop to an half mile high speed loop to different areas that represent different kinds of driving that you may encounter in the real world. One example, you can see the stoplight in the middle, it's a six by six intersection, uh, which are the kinds of intersections where some of the most accidents happen where people have to cut across many, many lanes. So these are purposely designed to challenge vehicles um, that are trying to increase the degrees of automation that they have. On top of that physical road infrastructure, uh, is a network infrastructure. So that combines cellular, 4G, and 5G soon, um, fiber optics throughout. Some of you may be familiar with what they call dedicated short range uh, communications or DSRC or cellular VDX, but these are ways that vehicles can communicate to each other, can communicate to the infrastructure. And then the ability to handle significant amounts of data and then sending that data to the cloud so that we can do uh, whatever analytics and computation that we have. So on top of the track is this network architecture uh, and this network architecture is becoming more and more important as people shift to more and more connected vehicle work, not just automated vehicle work. I'm not sure if people in the audience know the distinction, but you can have a connected car and you can have an automated car and then you can have a connected and automated car and they're, they're each uh, slightly different things. 
uh, automated vehicles or connected and automated vehicles generate petabytes of data, right? So just a single car alone can generate terabytes of data in a matter of uh, you know hours or even minutes. And in some cases, you know, you can fill a laptop in, in, in no time at all. So you have to have the ability to take massive amounts of data and move that data to the cloud or to some local place that you can analyze it. And this is a challenge for a lot of the, the companies today is just what to do with the data. Getting it off a vehicle takes a lot of time. And they often can't do more work until they analyze that data. So ACM has infrastructure that can move, you know, 100 gigs per second um, uh, uh, internet speeds relative to what your home speed might be, which is 200 megabits per second. So massively faster data infrastructure. On top of that, we bring in specialized equipment. So you have the roads, the network infrastructure, and then we bring in robotic targets. So these are basically targets that are on a flat robotic platform with a like a foam built car, we can use that to actually simulate crash scenarios with cars safely and repeatedly without actually, you know, bringing home to a pedestrian. And I always joke that you can watch that video over and over again. And I'm always surprised the pedestrian gets away every time. But uh, basically, you can do higher risk maneuvers on our track. Uh, and then we bring in things like environmental trailers where we can simulate rain. Uh, so we can test sensors and things uh, under those uh, different conditions. Uh, we also are a place where people do work physically on site. And in fact, one of our most used facilities are our garages. Um, one of the benefits of working at a place like ACM is you can drive in and drive out of a garage and be right on the track. And that saves you a lot of engineering time rather than having to drive two hours away. And so almost all of our garages are fully booked out. And in fact, Eastern is in one of our garages too. Uh, and, and we're looking at expanding that capacity, but just being able to be right there on property, go on a track, come back to the garage, download data, go on the track. That's very productive for the car companies uh, that are there. You may have heard the announcement that Toyota is actually building a facility uh, over at ACM. So all of those things together, the roads, the network infrastructure, the specialized equipment, come together to create um, a specialized facility for the testing of connected and automated vehicles. Um, and it allows us to replicate real world scenarios um, test the sensing and perception capabilities of the vehicle, uh, uh, test the connectivity of the vehicle. Eventually, most car companies today are working individually on their cars, but eventually you have to figure out whether different makes, models, and brands are interoper interoperable on the street. What happens when you have uh, a number of uh, different vehicles with radar on? What happens when you have significant communications happening? So we're, in, we're envisioning our facility eventually will go from using individual car companies testing their vehicles to actually car companies working together to, to test vehicles. I'll just play a short video here, just will give you a sense of the actual test track. And I have the sound muted, so you won't hear it just because it was giving a feedback loop, but I'll maybe narrate as we go. So we are a very expansive 500 acre test facility. Um, the uh, one of the unique features is the high speed loop that we have. There's a number of, of tracks out there that don't have one. M City, for example, you might be familiar with M City in Ann Arbor. I don't think they can go above 30 miles an hour. Well, our facility, um, we can drive 65 miles an hour. We've rated the track up to 90 under certain conditions. And in fact, on one of our straightaways, we just had a Tesla driver. There was a PR release. They, they were doing, I think, 100 mile an hour, you know, uh, tests on the track. Um, all of these things are, you know, specially designed to have smart intersections, um, uh, boulevards where we can actually do, you know, um, unstructured intersection testing, for example, um, roundabout features, uh, more common in, in other countries. And then places like urban canyons where we can intentionally try to block GPS or, or create multi-path radar situations. So again, a very expansive um, facility. And as I mentioned, you know, we have special vehicles that you can actually just drive right through and rebuild them. And it allows you to do, you know, kind of high risk of crash testing. We built an off-road environment recently for class eight vehicle trucking. And we're seeing a lot of interest in the off-road environments. And, you know, you, everybody here knows Michigan roads. They're cracked lane lines. They're, they're not perfect conditions. Um, and, and companies ask us to leave it like this. They actually don't want it to be perfect because it's what they need. To, um, to test their vehicles. It's a secure facility. There's a lot of sensitivity around um, people seeing what you're doing and then having privacy. So it's a controlled facility. Uh, because we're a, a nonprofit, uh, uh, there's less of a concern at working at a place like ACM. 
And you know, if people want to come and hire our engineers to run their programs, they can, or they can you know, bring their own companies out and, and run their own their own program. So when I had the title of the paper, it was you know shared infrastructure for accelerating validation of connected and autonomous vehicles. A facility like this, if you built it on your own, could take two hundred million dollars, hundred million to two hundred million dollars. And some car companies have such a facility, uh, but they have to repurpose it for this type of work, which takes a lot of money, and they have to then compete with the other vehicle development that they're doing. And so people often ask me, well, why is Toyota or Hyundai or Ford coming to ACM? These are very big car companies. Don't they have their own track? But you can imagine that testing uh, these vehicles is very expensive, and they'd rather spend their money on the testing and the development of their products than on building a facility and having multiple facilities all be the same thing. And so uh, shared infrastructure takes that out of the equation. They can focus less on spending money uh, on the infrastructure to test things and then more on the physical testing of things. And we're seeing that that's actually more and more uh, important in the connected and autonomous vehicle space. Um, just a few years back, there was intense competition um, between companies on who was going to be first in the market with autonomous vehicles. And I think, you know, as, as early as you know, 2017, people thought there would be tens of millions of autonomous vehicles on the road today. And so there was intense competition, lots of startup companies uh, coming out. Um, and like many new technologies, it starts with competition. And then people realize that it takes longer sometimes to get there than they think. So then they switch to collaboration, figuring out ways to get technologies from different groups. And then eventually that drives itself over to consolidation where you see companies buying other companies and then rolling them up into, into bigger companies. Uh, but all of that is, is driven on one thing, which is capital efficiency. It's you know making sure that your, your dollars go longer um, because it is very expensive endeavor to, to, to validate these kinds of technology. So a place like ACM is meant to be this um, shared infrastructure and then also a, a ecosystem of companies that we use to help build technologies that, that service that, that ecosystem. So think of us as a physical place to be, and then an ecosystem uh, on top of that of different companies. Uh, we were formed uh, as a result of a public-private partnership um, between the state of Michigan, uh, industry players, as well as academia. Uh, the state gave funding and land uh, the industry partners, uh, including uh, Toyota, Ford, Hyundai, Vistion, and others were what we call founders or sponsors, and they all contributed to the payout that helped us build this, this facility. So it was originally built by investors, but it's open to the public uh, and others can use the facility. And then we did form also an academic consortium uh, at the beginning, which includes uh, uh, EMU, um, to help develop next generation education and workforce development programs. Uh, to get that next generation um, um, uh, worker, uh, starting all the way back to K through 12. Uh, this is something that we're actively now starting to ramp up uh, and look forward to finding ways to, to partner with EMU and, and other universities to, to actually physically put some hands-on training uh, with, with students. So I mentioned the importance of collaboration um, and you know I showed you the map of the physical facility, but what I didn't show was the map of the collaborations that were required to build the facility like this. Um, ACM was built by forming strategic partnerships with different companies who could bring technology to ACM, integrate it into our test environment, and then allow us to use that technology. So every component we have from the roads and infrastructure, which were given by the state, the cellular and 5G, which is coming in from at and the fiber optics that were also brought in by at and Microsoft bringing in cloud services, uh, Siemens pre-scan bringing in the simulation, um, uh, as well as Siemens Mobility bringing in the ITS network. Everywhere we look at the facility, somebody partnered with ACM to bring that technology. And um, our staff alone is only eight people in our company, right? But we run a 500 acre, very large test facility because all these other strategic partnerships bring the technology and the capabilities uh, and then allow us to share that with, with others. We could never on our own, you know, bring in a 5G facility. So we keep adding more nodes in the network. And that's how we grow uh, to create the most capable facility. Uh, and, and half of the companies come there to test things. And there's a large number of companies that come there because they want to showcase or plug their technology in and have their technology be used. So we service both sides of that, of that uh, uh, customer base. 
Um, there's also, um, I mentioned the three layers of the Smart Mobility Test Center. It's the roads, it's the network infrastructure, and it's the equipment. There is a fourth layer, it's the digital and it's the virtual layer that's becoming increasingly important in terms of, of validating connected and autonomous vehicles. Um, uh, I mentioned already that massive amounts of data are produced, uh, but then people need to do something with that data to figure out you know, how to use it to train their artificial intelligence. Uh, and many companies have data, they don't share it, they, they drive millions of miles on the road, they, 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 you know, they have it as very close competitive information. Uh, and some companies that lack the data, but what's important is data is how, where you figure out how accidents happen, right? And we often call them the edge cases or the different scenarios that your artificial intelligence needs to respond to. So it's important to have that. And so how many of you have, have had to you know, do those, what are the, uh, I think they're called, uh, I'm not sure what the exact name is, but you have to verify like how many stop signs appear in the picture or how many tractors appear in the picture, right? That, that's, that's, that's Google and others using you to train their artificial intelligence. But, uh, but similarly, when somebody drives millions of miles on the road with the autonomous vehicle, somebody has to go through and annotate all the different stop signs. And if the stop sign was turned, um, somebody's going through physically logging all that information or if an accident almost happened, and then from that, they're creating what they call edge cases. And edge cases are what you use to test and validate autonomous vehicles. It's not the normal driving that's the issue. It's when you have some extreme events. So we're doing a lot of work to build a data management analytics platform. Um, we're doing this in partnership with Deloitte, but also a number of other companies I haven't listed here. But the key thing is ACM is trying to bring a, a cloud-based tool chain from data management analytics, 3D mapping, modeling and simulation, and then ultimately into things like augmented reality that um, allow you to, instead of building this all yourself, come to a place like ours and you basically pay as you go. It's a cloud-based service. You can log in, pick a map of a city or a track, you can pick a simulation tool, you can pick a library of edge cases, and then you can go and analyze things much more quickly. Um, the significance of that is it's very expensive to do this on your own and only very, very big companies can do it. So. Uh, through partnerships, we're bringing together uh, kind of a virtual set of tools that um, uh, are not typically available at, at any tracks. I'll talk a little bit about some of these as we go forward, particularly the augmented uh, reality. Um, so, and I'll just back up here just as kind of a segue. So, you know, I mentioned earlier how many miles it takes uh, to validate. Now, the reality is nobody's going to drive five million miles, right? That's just not practical. And we're not going to wait. For that to happen before these, you know, potentially life-saving technologies can be put on the road, so you have to accelerate that some, somehow. One way to accelerate that is you run, you know, exascale computing in the cloud, and you do many, many simulations, and you get there fast. Uh, another way to do it is to try to make the track mile or the mile that you drive more statistically uh, impactful. And so we've been working on ways that we think can take one mile on track and make it equal to 5,000 miles or even 10,000 miles in the real world. And if we can do that uh, in a controlled way, we can dramatically lower the cost and speed up the, the, the validation time uh, uh, for autonomous vehicles. And so that's one of the other ways that we view ourselves at ACM is we're not trying to just be a physical test track. We're trying to actually help you lower validation expense and, and compress the lead time to do that. And I'll give some examples of, of how we do that. So um, and this, these are some excerpts here. I may have, I'll pause it just here for a second if I can. If it doesn't let me pause it, I'm just gonna keep replaying it. But um, one second here. Okay, so um, I'll walk you through this a little bit slowly. So we've been working with uh, CCAT, Center for Connected and Automated Transportation at the University of Michigan, uh, as well as companies like Siemens to figure out a way that we can merge simulation and physical road testing so that we can speed things up. On the left-hand side, you see what we call a traffic simulator. It's an open source sumo uh, traffic simulator. And the red car is what we call the ego car. It's the, the main car in the scenario. And then surrounding it is a bunch of um, actually fake traffic. Like we've generated the traffic and we've simulated it and we've injected it into this model. In the center, you can see the actual real vehicle. This vehicle is driving on a track and uh, it's, you know, it's tracking its position and it's sensing and detecting objects around it. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the track where the car is actually driving and what it really sees if you were in it. And then at the bottom, you can see that we're augmenting it and we're injecting 
um, uh, images or actual uh, vehicles into the simulation. And so let me see if that works. So what that allows us to do is take a, a car and drive it into the real world, but simulate traffic and accident scenarios around it. So as that car is going around the track, one of those cars is picked to challenge the vehicle and it'll come in and execute some kind of maneuver to challenge the vehicle. So by the time the car goes around the track, it may experience you know, 5,000 times more uh, uh, accident scenarios, but it's done in a way that it doesn't bias the results, right? So this is called naturalistic and that it represents the real world. It's called adversarial and that it challenges the vehicle. And so this is courtesy of, of uh, University of Michigan, but we're working with them on some projects at Siemens. And what this allows you to do is actually run one track mile and um, simulate traffic. Imagine trying to do this in the real world. You, you, you couldn't go onto a public road and, and dictate what traffic was gonna do, but you can go on a track in a safe way and do it. Uh, and, and there's no accident that really happens here, right? So just some other examples of the tools. This one's a highway merging scenario. Um, so we can do you know, um, scenarios where we have a vehicle merging if you look at the lower right, and you know we can trigger it to either try a certain kind of accident maneuver, uh, and then see whether the uh, artificial intelligence responds appropriately. Uh, and we can even, if we want, inject. Um, you know, in Michigan, this is common, right? But to inject deer or something, right? An animal into the road, um, and and surprisingly enough, you know, the cameras don't always know how to detect things like that, right? Depending upon what region of the country you're in. So those are like examples of tools that we develop that then are available for companies to use um, for uh, validation of their technologies. And, and the ultimate goal is that, that they spend more time on their products and, and leverage the tools that we have. Uh, in addition to you know, testing and validation of connected and autonomous vehicles for private companies, we do a considerable amount of funded research. Uh, there's been about $40 million in funded research awarded uh, to uh, the American Center for Mobility or its partner ecosystem, primarily from the, the Department of Energy and as well as the Department of Transportation. Uh, but again, a, a lot of the most uh, compelling and provocative work we do is for the federal work. And we're actually looking for ways with EMU to, to see whether we can partner on, on research going uh, forward. So I often will put this a chart like this up because it's sometimes hard to explain to people like how they can engage with a place like ACM. Are you a track? Are you a business development location? Uh, you know, what, what are the ways I can engage? And what I have found since coming to ACM is when we show people what's possible, they usually will identify themselves the opportunities that we haven't thought about. So um, somebody could come to use our infrastructure or provide our infrastructure. That's one example of a model. Others could come to test component technologies. Um, for example, LIDAR, or they could come with the vehicle assets. And, you know, there were, uh, there were ways that, um, you know, uh, our initial customers all started off as just vehicle companies, but now we have individual technology companies now. Cybersecurity, developing of advanced tools, uh, developing of standards and regulations, developing the next generation workforce. So this is kind of the overall canvas of like what we do at ACM. It's not just a physical test facility. It is a, a lot of different things, and this comprises the ecosystem of, of activities. We are also uh, engaged in activities that happen outside of our physical uh, test facility. Uh, some of you may have seen the announcement on this. Uh, it was announced by Governor Whitmer back in, in August about a smart parking lab in Detroit uh, that we operate on behalf of a set of automotive partners. Um, many of you might know the statistic that at any given point in time, 12% uh, of the cars on the road are looking for parking. So that's just 12% of the time they're just circling, looking for parking. And that's, that's a waste of energy, it's a waste of time. And, and to be candid, nobody likes wasting time looking for parking. And if you go to places like Detroit, parking is, is one of the areas that prevents people from, it's just difficult sometimes to find parking. Uh, so this lab was created similar to the American Center for Mobility to be a shared space where people can come in and test smart parking technologies. It could be contactless systems for the gate, it could be automated valet where you get out of the car and the car parks itself. It could be automated valet parking and then it connects to a wireless charger. We're seeing all sorts of interesting ideas come into this space. But the key thing is it's providing people a controlled space to do the work. We operate it. Uh, uh, companies uh, like Ford, Bedrock, Bosch, 
uh, are sponsors of it, as well as MEDC, and then we allow other companies to kind of come in there. So another example of a place that you can showcase technologies um, and you, you know, you, you can't necessarily recreate this in a parking lab or a normal parking garage because you don't control you know, what's happening in that, in that space. And then running adjacent to ACM is this uh, autonomous vehicle corridor that the state approved in partnership with a company called Capnu, where they're taking a route from Ann Arbor all the way to Detroit, and they're going to turn it into a connected and automated uh, vehicle road, or at least have a dedicated lane on that road. And what makes this interesting for us is that you can come to a test track like ACM or, or MCity, you can validate um, your technologies in a controlled way, and then you can go out onto the connected and autonomous vehicle corridor and test it in the real world, right? So another example of infrastructure that was set aside solely for the validation of these technologies. And again, Michigan is very leading in that sense. There's more assets like this than I think uh, just about anywhere else. But uh, we're located right adjacent to the corridor, and we're also we're part of a partnership to help kind of validate solutions before they get deployed into that, into that corridor. So this gives you the public road component of it, because you eventually have to get off the track, you have to get out and test things in the real world, but it helps feed into that virtuous cycle of public road driving, uh, back to simulation, simulation back to track, and then eventually merging, we think even more so merging simulation and physical testing is going to be a, a very big thing. So I'm going to switch gears here just a little bit. That kind of covered the um, spectrum of what we do at ACM uh, from a, being a physical test facility for car companies to come and small companies to come. Uh, there are some people in the audience here that I think that have companies located you know, at our facility that use a facility. But we're often asked the question, so where are things headed? When is an automation coming? Um, things that we see happening at our track, we can't always talk about, it's confidential. But I tried to weave for the Motor Bella show a few months back, some insights. So I'll just share with you a few things. So I think the first trend that we're seeing is that while there's still a number of companies working on level four and level five automation, uh, there's been a shift back to what we call advanced driver assistance systems. And I'm not sure if people know. I don't know the level of, of experience people have with some of these terms. So at the end, if you have questions, you can ask me. But advanced driver assistance systems are like what we call on a scale of zero to five, five being fully automated, zero being you get some warning signals. It's you're still in control of the car. You have to keep your hands on the wheel. But we're seeing a lot of testing in the advanced driver assistance systems. These are things that are going into your car now. And we're seeing more and more makes and models having blind spot detection, uh, forward collision uh, avoidance, uh, automated emergency braking, lane centering. These are things that assist you, but they don't drive for you. Um, but they do get fairly close to that level of, you know, you see something called traffic jam assist, right? That's, you know, so if you're in a traffic jam, the car can maybe help nudge you and move you along. Um, so a lot of work going towards level two. And then the other thing we're seeing is that, um, you know, you need a combination of cameras, uh, radar and LIDAR. Some people think you need all of them to have fully automated vehicles. Many car companies are seeing how much they can get out of the camera systems. I know Tesla has said they're going to try to go all the way to automation with cameras only, but I think that people are just trying to see how far they can get. Uh, some would tell you that you have to have LiDAR and other things to get full automation. Um, with regards to AV testing, it's a little bit harder to see where people are in terms of fully off, full automation or level four or five automation because they, they do it in a very confidential way. Plus, we don't always get to see the level of readiness of their software. So I would just say this, that our observations based on where people are testing at our facility are that most people are just doing high speed work. They're on the highway loops and they're driving around, they're shaking down their vehicles, but they haven't really got into um, a lot of uh, the different other test environments. I think they're really focused on highway driving in places that they can more clearly deploy the controlled environment automation. Um, we haven't seen much work in um, 5G yet, uh, in vehicle VDAX. Uh, mainly at the research level. Um, so that's more to come. And um, uh, we are seeing a pickup in the area of, of smart parking. So in theory, you can get a level two system to do level four automation in parking because it's in a controlled area and you, know, you can you know, essentially call it uh, level, level four. Now, 
if some of you aren't familiar with um, the levels, and I would have put this first, not knowing what the audience's uh, the background is, um, a lot of people uh, are, you know, kind of dividing uh, the, the the work into either kind of level two or level two uh, or less, and then kind of level three or greater. And some people are referring to their work as level two plus. Uh, SAE publishes a, a, a guideline around the definitions on these, and, and I paraphrased it, so I'm not going to try to change anything. Please go to SAE JERC or J3016 spec for the real definition. But if you can think about it in this regard, level zero are like warnings. Level one, you're going to get steering or braking or acceleration assistance. Level two, you're going to get a combination of those things, but you're still having to drive the car. Um, and so there's a huge focus on level two. Some companies are saying they have level two plus. There's really no definition of level two plus. But I think what they're trying to say is, in their belief, it's really level three, but they're still telling you to hold on to the wheel. You're responsible, right? It's more of a, it's got the capability, but, but it can't drive itself. Um, level three is where, um, in theory, you can take your hands off the wheel, but you still need to be paying attention. The driver is expected to get back on and grab the wheel if need be. Some people think that that's not a good place to be because once the driver is distracted, they can't re-engage. But there are companies out there putting out level three systems. They're doing it in a way where it's in very specialized, what they call operating design domains. Um, and they're almost all going to come with driver monitoring now, right? To make sure that you are paying attention. It's going to be almost a, a prerequisite. But think of people driving down a highway. It's a, a highway with a separator. There's no cross traffic. Um, in those modes, there are companies out there letting you, you know, take your hands off the wheel and, and, um, and operate in a more automated fashion. Level four is um, going to be coming in fleets. So robo taxis in very controlled environments. Um, and then the day where you have level five, level five is like, um, you know, uh, uh, level three is like eyes off the road. I think level five is like wheel off the car, right? It's just a different car design. You don't need the wheel anymore. It can drive you in any and all environments, uh, fully automated. Uh, I'm just going to venture to say it's beyond 2030. Some would say it's even well beyond that. But, um, but I don't have a crystal ball. Um, I think it's going to take a little time where you and I can sleep in the backseat in every environment it risks you away. But it's coming, right? It, the progression is there. So related to that trend, um, we are seeing a lot more work happening on driver engagement technologies. Um, and this is for two reasons. One is, um, is uh, for its use in automation, right? If they're going to let you have an automated vehicle, or with, uh, they want you to know you're paying attention. Um, two is just driver distraction in general, right? So fleet operators, uh, we were seeing we're seeing an increase in accidents despite a significant decrease in driving, right? We drove a lot less in, in, because of COVID and accidents went up. It is because people are far more distracted. Uh, and then something I'm very interested in, I, I've just been waiting for a long time, I don't know why, but I really like, you know, heads up, head up displays and, and the ability to get more information. And so, you know, this was some of this was actually announced at CES in 2017, and things didn't happen as fast, so they're, they're now coming back out with this again. This is all courtesy of Panasonic and Valio, but their belief is that head-up displays initially will help people get comfortable with the features in the car, and then eventually, uh, when the car drives itself, it can be used to provide other information. But I think one of the issues is how big the head-up display has to be to actually get you full coverage on, on the windshield. But I think the, these are the ways where you can say, hey, is my car really going to help me avoid that bicyclist? You get the visual cue, but then the car is, is doing some of the things it's doing. There's also a heavy amount of work being done on what we call vulnerable road users. So bicyclists, pedestrians, um, some of the connected vehicle technologies that are coming are really going to focus on those first. And you're, we're seeing a very big push from the government to fix those. So imagine you have something on your bike built in that's a chip, you know, that's communicating um, with the car, your car knows then that there's bicycles coming and you can pass them. Um, so connectivity, uh, I mentioned earlier that there's connectivity and then there's automation and then there's connected and automated together. Um, an automated vehicle without connectivity is just driving on its own sensors, right? Its own information about the map and where it is, but it's not connected or communicating with other cars and it's not communicating with the infrastructure. Um, connected with automation is, is just connected, but it's not necessarily automating the vehicle. It's getting information, but it's not doing it. A lot of people view, particularly the federal government, that connected and automated, or what they call cooperative driving automation, is the end state that they want to get to. Because with cooperative driving automation, 
Um, it's not just my car sensing what you're doing. When you hit the brake, you know, my car knows you hit the brake. It, it's, it's talking to one another. And some people would argue that the only way to get the benefits of connect of automated vehicles is to have connectivity. This is the only way you're going to get all the traffic and a traffic jam to move, you know, synchronously um, and, and the full complement of, of, of kind of reducing congestion, reducing accidents, improving throughput, driving faster, all that. Uh, the only concern that some people have is it might take a while before we deploy ubiquitous 5G or ubiquitous cellular V2X. So some of the automation uh, companies want to move forward just on, on what their vehicles could do themselves and then integrate connectivity going forward. Um, but it's, it's our belief that you're going to see these two things happening in parallel. Um, you're not going to wait for, for perfection to get all the connectivity out there. And when you do see connectivity, it's going to be more prevalent in, in accident prone areas, I think, first versus um, you know, uh, areas where it's less prevalent. So it's coming soon, but it's going to take a while. Uh, and that ties into things like 5G. Uh, so there's DSRC, which I mentioned earlier, dedicated short range communication. That's really sending messages directly, right? Vehicle to vehicle. And, so, and DSRC may or may not uh, stand the test of time given some government regulations, but a substitute cellular beta X is there. But that's, that's not normal cellular. That's like direct vehicle to vehicle communications. And then layered in on top of that is 5G. And um, there's a lot of hype on 5G, right? You'll see a lot of advertisements. And I think that um, uh, 5G for automotive purposes uh, is still in its nascent phase. It's coming out for cellular, um, for your handhelds. Uh, and, and what's coming out isn't the final end state of what 5G is going to be. 5G is meant to be you know, 10x faster, low latency. Um, it's not going to be necessarily fast enough to control all your vehicles, right? Like it, 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 it's going to allow for um, kind of bigger picture traffic management, but not necessarily all of the accident avoidance and things I mentioned. Uh, but a lot of people are thinking that combination of 5G plus some uh, better automation is 80% of the problem. And, and, and so um, you're going to see 5G and a lot more work happening with 5G. But people are still thinking about how they're going to use it um, in their testing. So we are implementing 5G from AT&T, and um, hopefully we'll start seeing a lot more testing in that area. So I will uh, kind of bring it back to point here. I think I'm actually close on time. Um, but... In order to clear the validation hurdle for autonomous vehicles, um, you know, we, we've already acknowledged that public road testing is not enough, right? It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. You need to have an integrated approach of simulation track and road. Um, you need to have more advanced tools that start to take things to the cloud so you can get much higher levels of compute. Um, we need to have more advanced tools like augmented reality uh, and scenario generation tools. Um, car companies haven't even started to test how their vehicles are going to work with other companies' vehicles, and there needs to be standards in place that you can test against. So, um, you know, the key message I had at the beginning was, you know, validating AVs using shared infrastructure. Our play at ACM is to provide that shared infrastructure so you can focus on your product development, not on building up different test facilities. But we also acknowledge that we need to have this next level of capability and tools to actually uh, validate these technologies a lot faster. So uh, I think with that, um, I will pause to take questions. And I know I'm a, a fast talker, so if I need to go back to anything, I can be glad to do it. I thought it was back in the, uh, on the um, uh, on time. So I'll open the floor here for questions in the time. And I don't know if you go to us to our coming up by a group, please post your questions. Uh, in the chat area, and uh, we'll, if we have time, we'll, uh, we'll go to those. But we'll start with questions from the middle. So, um, I was wondering is most of the done uh, what you think is most of the work being done at high speeds and autonomous vehicles because that's easier or because you think that's what people would like first? Yeah, it's a, well, I, I would break it into two pieces. So I think most of the work being done at our facility is being done at high speeds because people are focused on these ADAS systems, advanced driver assistance systems. And so, it, you know, consider highway driving, right? A natural place to deploy that type of technology. But I do think that there is other low speed work happening with shuttles and things like that. Um, and we're just starting to get more shuttle work at our facility in the low speed areas. So. I think it's really around um, high speed because people are focusing on stuff that can go into cars tomorrow to help. Adaptive cruise control is a good example. And then low speed is where all these robo taxis and shuttles are going out, you know, around around cities. 
Do you have a question? Good. So how exact are you in one of the slides talked about in one of the slides we talked about the federal funding? Yeah. For the cyber security control of the how how is that being spent out of like what testing are you doing? Yeah. Um so it's interesting. So uh we have um we have this large electrical substation that was a remnant of the GM plant that used to be there. And that substation lets us decouple it from the grid, okay? So we're able to, uh, and we're also putting in a dynamic wireless charging road. So a road that's like an inductive charger that you can drive over. And we're doing simulated attacks on the grid through that charging infrastructure. Um, and uh, so our place is the location and then other companies are coming in some of the national labs. But that's an example where we can, safely attack the grid because we have our own private grid we can take it offline and show how EV chargers and things you know could be vulnerable. Any other questions from the audience here? I was wondering um do you use virtual reality while the car is on the road to simulate um you know those edge cases to where the car the computer in the car would understand that it's happened but the car wouldn't actually you know uh, react yeah, the car. So what I was showing you is, it's a. Um, you have a real car driving down the road, and we are running a simulation on a computer adjacent to it. We're feeding the car's information into the simulator, and we're feeding the simulator back to the car. So the car's on the road. It feels like there's traffic around it, and we're throwing challenges at the car. So it'll all of a sudden say, "Okay, that vehicle is going to do whatever maneuver and cut it off." And it's testing whether the car really responds physically on the track or not. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but the car is actually responding to this, this virtual traffic that's being injected uh, into its with positional information, and then we're also injecting it into the sensors. Okay, so it's an empty road, and you want to see the car react to virtual edge cases. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So we use real data from real driving to create those scenarios. But the problem with the real world is you can't repeat those tests over and over again, right? So once you know what the edge cases are, you can feed them into the into the virtual or augmented reality. Okay. If, have you done any of, I believe you said the term was guided software. Yep. Have you done any of that testing at higher speeds? So I mean, it's probably harder since software is at high speeds so and probably just blow it away. But would that be possible? And, would that help at all? I well, I don't know how that I have to check how fast the soft targets go. There's a video you saw that we were doing some mm -hmm. kind of intersection work. So I, I don't know how fast those flat targets go. I'd have to check. Um, but the benefit of those is you just drive right over the top of the if you do hit it. Um, and then some of this, some of this other augmented reality work would take it a step further, which is you can do that at high speed because there's nothing to hit, right? It's simulated. Let me see if there are questions on the chat that Rebecca goes. Yes, um, we can see a question. Do you foresee a creation of an association of society of AV to improve the integration, perhaps a sector of SAV? Um, well, I mean, there are a number of different associations or bodies like SAE that are actually looking at standards uh, around autonomous vehicles already. So, um, uh, I don't know how many new ones would come up. I think the existing kind of standard setting bodies, trade associations, and others would would simply adopt more EV work, EV work, and they already are doing it. It's the same thing when ACM was formed. We were going to create our own set of our own set of standards, our own standard setting body, and then we determined that well, sometimes it's better not to compete. It's better to find what it what exists out there. So, SAE is actually the one that publishes like all those like levels and definitions. And so I think if I'm asking to answer the question right, I think it's really, there are already a lot of associations out there and they're each kind of taking their piece of the AV, of the AV kind of ecosystem. Sure. Any other questions here? Yes. Are you able to simulate like the bad weather environments in the virtual reality? Or how, I guess, how actually is that to like other yeah, there is. There's another video I have that we inject rain in, into it, um, and uh, and I, I, the models are getting better and better in terms of these multi-physics models, right? In terms of simulating the properties and materials and things. 
The one thing I just have to clarify though is that um, the first round of virtual reality stuff I showed you is we're sending what we call basic safety messages, which are like, it's like directions, like information about what direction things are heading. But we're not injecting something in the sensors. And then some of the other work we did tried to bring in these sensor models where we could inject, you know, like simulate LIDAR, right? How LIDAR would work. So I don't know the, the degree of accuracy of those tools yet, um, but they're getting much better, right? And so that's the ultimate end game for us is I can simulate weather and I can simulate whether uh, how my um, my sensors react. Radar is another example. I mean, it's, it's not, I don't want to oversimplify, but if you want to simulate radar and all these things together in there, that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to, to make it as close to real world. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, who's the power? Do you hear the power? So my question is the vendor that's not. Yeah, this is something, and some of these things I'm, I'm, I'm showing you are perspective things, we're doing them. So this autonomous uh, cloud I showed was an example of where um, rather than have local compute, we're going to have it where people can in a turnkey fashion set up for cloud compute. Oh. And then you can pick the degree of computation that you need. And then our desire is that you only pay for it as you need it, right? So you don't have to go out and buy your own. I mean, there are some of our customers that have their own local compute and it's significant, um, but that's the ultimate end game that you would be able to on demand, get access to that, to that um, scalable power. Yeah, well, I think if I understand the question, correct, uh, the question correctly, one is, you know, offline, you're running simulations. Two is you're actually doing cloud compute while you're right. driving. We're actually, this year, we're, we're taking, what I showed you was locally computed augmented reality, but we're actually testing the latency already. And we think the latency is fast enough to do cloud computing, like less than 50 milliseconds. And so the thought is that we could shift it to, to do cloud compute as well, but that's what we're demonstrating this year. And ultimately, that's what people want to test at our facility is we are looking at putting in edge compute and cloud compute. And the companies have to figure out, do I calculate something on the car? You know, do I send it to the edge? Do I send it to the cloud? And our goal is to have that infrastructure there that they can test to it. But I think companies are just now getting to that, trying to find the right balance because there's just way too much data coming off the car to, you know, send everything up and, and put it back down. So I'm not, does that answer your question? Or, yeah. I do actually have a question to come in on. Uh, there's a focus on the uh, accidents and the crash and fatalities. Uh, and that's, I think, uh, the right stage to make sure that the car is safe. Uh, but is there an attention, um, any attention to the cyber security of the vehicle, the possible hacking into uh, this uh, connected system? Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we are trying to develop a focus area there um, in partnership with other institutions. Um, many of the autos handle a lot of the, the cybersecurity very close to the, to the best, so to speak, because it's a very competitive area. So we don't necessarily have automotive companies coming to us yet to ask us for infrastructure to test on cybersecurity, but we think that there's a band of companies in the small to medium sized range that have an interest there. So I, the long answer to your question is, everybody knows it needs to be done. Some companies are doing it independently. And what we're trying to do in the next year or so is bring in some data security, cybersecurity focus and capabilities onto the campus so that other companies can use our, our environment for, for cyber related work. And then uh, I think as I answered earlier, we actually have some grant funded work that we're doing on cyber um, related to EVs uh, in our infrastructure. So um, it, it's an area that needs a lot of work and, um, but it's also a very highly competitive area, right? And so somewhere in there, I think also in the workforce side, there needs to be this component of, of training and facility, you know, for, you know, for more advanced cyber thinking upfront in the design process of things. Very good. Yes. So you said, I believe that um, I agree with what, 100 gigabytes per second? So yeah. yeah. So how long, and you said that the cars are generating 
Yeah. Terabytes or petabytes? Yeah. 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 And how, how much does an individual or average petabyte per generate? That question. Yeah. And I'll clarify because I've been lecturing on this. There's 100 gigabits and 100 gigabytes, yeah. and it's 100 gigabits. Okay. But uh, a bit's not funny. But um, uh, but um, I, you know, as I remember it, like a single car could generate a couple of terabytes of data. You know, just in a matter of driving around for a you know short period of time on the track. And if you have a fleet of them, it's petabytes of data. And what we keep hearing from our customers is even though they have this act, they get 100 gigabits per second, it's still not fast enough. Like to get everything off, to learn something from it, and then to go back on the track. So a lot of companies are trying to do things locally too, to take as much data off as you can, figure out what's good, use it, go back on the track, send the rest of it back up to the cloud. So um, it takes quite a bit of time, even with that fiber optic and that very high speed internet. You know, I always put it in perspective, like it's, it's that kind of internet speed, at least today is not generally available. Right under the lights. It's only in certain locations. So and that's the that that I go back to that for that type of experiment. Yeah, yeah. I mean they 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 try to take it off their car as fast as they can. Some companies have dedicated their own dedicated lines at a place like ours because they don't want to share lines because it's in confidential data and it goes back all the way to their um let's take uh, one final question from the chat, Rebecca. What are yeah. Yeah, that's uh, a good question. Right now, I, I feel like my observation is that people haven't gotten to the snow testing yet. Um, uh, because that was one of the things that we were sure that people would really need to work on is testing in snow in Michigan. But I think uh, uh, right now they're fo focusing a lot on just getting things to work without snow. Now, with that said, what we're starting to do at our facility is have like notices that go out for snow days so that people know that snow days are coming. And we actually have some people that are now coming, you know, that may have been doing heavy testing down in the South. They're coming up now to Michigan to do more tomorrow testing. Um, there were some interesting things that I saw. It, was actually, it wasn't done at our facility, but it was done by, I think it was Western Michigan University that presented at our facility on things that they were doing to, to figure out new ways to get cars to operate AVs in snow. And so rather than trying to detect, detect lane lines, they were using biomimicry which is how do people do it? Well, people follow the tire tracks of the other car in front of them, yeah. you know, and so why not make your AV follow the tire tracks in snow? So I think people are thinking about it, but we haven't seen as much work in the area. I think it's more to come. Um, I think right now people are just trying to get their systems to work and then they'll deal with the, the snow question uh, afterwards. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you all also for coming and uh, hopefully we'll see you all in the next TikTok. Thank you all.